I walked in the garden this morning with bare feet, enjoying the feeling of cool soil on my skin and warm sun on my face. It's been so nice having a garden. The past three years in Houston had me feeling so removed from the food and plant life that I'd grown up with in the lush and productive valleys of the Pacific Northwest. The apples at the nearby Target had all of the crunch of the apples I remember, but none of the sweetness, none of the aroma, nothing of what made an apple worth biting into. Even if I took the bus to the small farmer's market, the vegetables there were already wilted by the heat radiating from surrounding concrete and glass and tasted ever so slightly of adjacent highway. And there was delicious fried fish and chicken on every corner, so that's what we ate. But we moved recently. But we moved recently from my job in a soil ecology lab and we settled in a rural area of Vermont, a state I had never thought about until I had decided to move there. It all started with herbs, just to supplement our meat and potatoes diet that we had fallen into while living in the city. It was like a breath of fresh air, thyme and sage in my burger patties, fresh dill on my sour cream. I always thought that gardening would be a calm and peaceful activity, but I was surprised by the urgency that it sometimes demands. We have to use the cilantro today or it'll bolt and we won't get any. This urgency was compounded by the abundance of vegetables that just found their way into our home. For example, my boyfriend got a job at a coffee shop that also sells at the Saturday market. He gives coffee to the farmers in exchange for unsold vegetables at the end of the day. How could he refuse a smiling, sun-kissed farmer who is saying that you just have to try the radish? We can use it all each week with careful planning. Some things I can pickle, but it's spring still, and how do you pickle salad greens? And then there's my job. I work with an older grumpy man that only seems to light up when he talks about his kids or his garden. I took an interest and was rewarded with six tomato starts on my desk one day. I have to keep them fertilized and watered because he asks about them every now and then. And then my boss left town leaving me to pick up her CSA, a brimming basket she gets each week to feed her family of four. It's too many vegetables for us, but I feel responsible for them. We are starting to run low on pickle jars and have started having salad and a fried egg for breakfast. It's become a bit of an obsession to eat all these vegetables. But honestly, it's been transformational. I think it's right what they say about how eating well can improve your mood. Back in Houston, I was always reading or watching TV or playing games on my phone. Now my spare time is spent out here, being productive. I've moved beyond herbs. I'm making structures for pea plants and deeply watering the roots of transplanted raspberry bushes. The other day, I found a crop of radishes that I had forgot to plant, hidden among the weeds. I can almost feel the chlorophyll as I chew out of my morning breakfast, coursing my veins and turning the sunshine into happiness and contentment. My boyfriend gets mad at me for going into the garden with bare feet because he says my feet are getting gnarly and I always track in soil. I just don't see the point of washing off something so good and sweet as soil. But he's right. My feet are getting a little weird. They're dry and crackling like the hands of a landscaper or forester, or like the base of cactus cutting that's been hardening off. There's even a bunion. But I just can't give up the feeling of being so close to soil. I spend so much time in it, I, I might as well be comfortable. As a soil ecologist, I know that soil is teeming with life. Fungi, bacteria, viruses, worms, parasites, insects, you name it. I also know that this life is not well understood. In the case of fungi, people say that 90% of fungal specimens remain to be discovered. I know that soil is generally safe, and it is actually good to expose yourself to a wide variety of microbes. But I also can't stop thinking about the medical section of my undergraduate mycology course, where we learned about fungal skin diseases. One in particular, blastomycosis, comes from a fungal spores liberated from disturbed soil in the eastern U.S. and causes lung infections and bark-like skin lesions. That's not what's happening to me, but it's made me think about what's still unknown in our soil that could potentially be infectious. I have been spending so much time in the garden that I sometimes fall asleep in the camping chairs we set out on our back porch. I don't know when it started happening, but sometimes I would wake up on the ground to the smell of soil until the sun warmed me up enough and I would sneak back into our shared bed. My boyfriend thinks I've lost it. 
that I'm spending too much time in the garden, that I'm serving him grilled romaine for dinner. But this interest isn't about him. It's about me. I don't think it's actually a bunion on closer inspection. I noticed it as I was washing my feet before heading inside. I've been more self-conscious about them recently. The dryness and cracking have gone away, but in its place are a few little skin tags. And the little bunion thing is getting bigger. My boyfriend says I should go to the doctor, but my foot actually feels normal, and I haven't been concerned about it until just now when I noticed a little... A little nail. I think this bunion thing might actually be a toe. For some reason, I felt the need to hide it right away. I put on some shoes and wore them to the bedroom. Then I put on some socks for safety. I only let it out when I am gardening. My boyfriend doesn't bother me out here anymore. In truth, we've been fighting, and he mostly stays at a co-worker's house. I only mention that because I actually haven't slept once in the bedroom since he left. Now the tomatoes are bulging red in the garden. They are a looming reminder that I will soon have many more vegetables than I know what to do with. I already have to eat my boyfriend's share of the produce. If I don't eat the zucchini or asparagus in time, they will lose their tenderness and succumb to a woody replication of their ideal selves. Already, so much has been wasted in the compost pile which has grown large since spring. The center has grown hot with microbial activity and has churned out black, nutrient-rich soil. I know this because I reached my hand into the center of it, and pulled out a handful, and tasted it. Recently, my sixth toe fell off. It didn't bleed or scab. It's almost like it was never there, save for the small indentation it left behind. I buried it in the garden to hide it. I covered the hole with compost and water it like everything else in the garden. I'm hungry. All the time. No matter how many vegetables I eat. I only move in the sunlight now, and when I do, the skin tags pull up soil as I walk. One morning in my garden, I was lying next to the hole where I buried my bunion and watching it as the sun rose. I noticed a bit of compost raised above the rest. I brushed it off to reveal a long, keratinous nail, tinted as green as my own. I can't explain it, but I felt so much joy. I bared my teeth and a big smile. Betty is my neighbor, and has been for 27 years. She always had something to say about other people's business. Betty always had a particular way of doing it too. A way that just got under your skin like the prickly spines of a cactus. She sure had something to say after my husband took off with that younger girl he met at a bar. Haven't seen Bobby around much lately, she said when hanging her laundry on the line one day. She said it from behind a pink towel that was blowing around in the wind, but I got a glimpse of that snide smile creeping onto her face. She was reveling in the fact my marriage was dissolving. <sighs> Jealous old shrew. I fumed in silence and went on picking up the pieces of my life. And then, just a few months later, I got a knock at my door. There she stood at my door, grinning like a giddy child on Christmas Day. Her puffy cheeks rose as her smile widened, like she was proud of her yellow, speckled teeth. Got your mail at my place by accident, Holly. Betty offered me my mail, ripped open at the top. Was reading it by accident, thinking it was mine, but thank God it's yours. With that, she handed me the letter from my doctor's office and sauntered back to her house. <sighs> I knew she had read it. My diagnosis. But thank God it's yours. Her voice swam around in my head as I read the crushing muse. I always loathed that noisy woman. And the way she'd pick away at people. Everyone in our neighborhood did. Everyone in our neighborhood did. 
Betty always played the role of the innocent cat lady who meant no harm, though. There was no method to her words that skirted the line between naive and downright evil. There was a method to her words that skirted the line between naive and downright evil. So calm and quiet this summer, she'd said to Mrs. Miller a few doors over one day. Might seem like a pleasant observation, but she said this after Mrs. Miller lost her daughter and grandchildren in a terrible fire. They hadn't visited that summer to splash about in the pool, all screaming and giddy like they had the past five years in a row. I'd heard the tragic news a few days earlier, and I knew Betty had too. I watched Mrs. Miller break down in tears in the middle of the street before running indoors. Once again, I saw that sinister smile creep onto Betty's face, raising those wrinkled cheeks and lighting up her eyes. It was about then I'd had enough of Betty. Pretty sure we all had. An idea that grew until it developed into a routine. I started watching Betty's house from my bedroom window through the blinds. I began to learn her schedule, when she'd be out each day for lunch in town, when she'd visit the park each week, and salon once a month. I cut up some fatty, raw steak and brought it to her house when she'd driven off. I then made my way over to her house and dished a dozen or so morsels of that raw meat through her cat door. They all came running, all fourteen of those cats. Some orange, some calico, some black, and some white. All rushed over and began to feast in a ravenous frenzy. They barely touched their bowl of dry cat food, so I reached in and took the plastic bowl and emptied it out in the trash. I made feeding Betty's cats a habit. Every time she'd get in her car and drive off, I'd walk over and deliver the fresh red meat. The cats would shove each other aside to get to the cat door and they'd feed voraciously, their primal urges drawing them forth and dilating their slits of eyes. Each visit, I'd toss out the dried cat food and head back home. For weeks, I did this. I'd stare out my window and watch the cats slinking about in her living room. They looked plump and happy. That's when I changed course. Two months into my duties as head chef for Betty's cats, I stopped bringing meat. Instead, I'd wait until she drove off, and then I'd walk over with nothing but a plastic measuring cup. I'd then reach in and remove a scoop or two from their large cat bowl just enough to keep them lean and hungry. Each time I took a little more until they began to hiss and scratch at my hand whenever I reached in to chip away at their food supply. They were getting more aggressive, and that made me smile a bit like Betty might when feigning concern for one of the neighbor's misfortunes. Soon those cats began to howl at night something awful. It was a sickening sound that curdled my blood and raised the hairs on my arms. I lift the curtain of my window and peek into her living room and see the cats wandering about, thin and bony. A few nights I saw Betty's light come on, and I'd hear her yelling at a large group of felines. I began to hear that growling and hissing responding back at her. I slept soundly those nights. Then came the first Tuesday of the month, when Betty would drive off to her salon appointment. This day, her car sat in the driveway reflecting the sun. I heard no hissing and no growling. And then I saw a plump tabby perched in the window, its fur stained red. It brought a smile to my face. It's been a week and Betty's car is still sitting in her driveway. A few white splats of bird poop have decorated her windshield and that made me smile. She sure would be pissed off but I have a feeling she's not going to the car wash. I'll likely call in the next few days to ask for a wellness check, but not right now. Right now, I just want to savor the moment and watch Betty's cats leisurely mosey about, well-fed and content. And my lord, those cats are getting fat. Thank you for watching this video. Big shout out to my patrons, Leaf Ninja, Roy Larimer, Mr. Creepy Pasta, Nicole Kister, Neon Scoundrel, William Delphin, and So Much Heresy. If you want to become a patron, buy merch, or join my Discord server, be sure to check out the links in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video. The hostess led us to our table, 
the waiter took our orders, and soon enough, Richard, Denise, and I started dinner. The conversation was pleasant, if largely vacuous. I don't remember the details, and I suppose they don't matter. I just remember watching Denise bite into her chicken sandwich. Her teeth made a faint, squishing noise as they dug in. Grease and ranch dressing mixed together into a white, pus-like goo that oozed down the sides of her mouth. I turned to Richard. He was dipping his fries in the ketchup, swirling them round, swooshing them in deeper and deeper till they formed a bloody paste on his fingertips. Denise laughed at a joke I must have made. It was a combination of shriek and gurgle. I could see a lump of partially chewed food stuck to the back of her tongue. The liquid running down her mouth congealed on the tip of her chin, swelling up into droplets that broke free and plummeted into the plate below. Soon enough, dinner was over. We split the check and I headed home. I know that we were all friends at some point, maybe back in school. The why escapes me. Time moves on, I suppose. And so do people. Really, Denise and Richard were nice enough. I guess that makes me the jerk. Which might explain why they had each other and I came home to an empty house. I watched some TV, brushed my teeth, and went to bed. Ready to start the great cycle again tomorrow. About two months later, Richard gave me a call. After some dull catching up, we made plans for another evening get-together. This time, though, Richard had something else in mind. A friend of theirs had recommended an obscure diner a little ways out of town. A bit of a drive, but apparently amazing, provided you don't mind heartburn. It seemed like a lot of trouble, but for want of any plausible way to excuse myself, I agreed to meet them there. I could hear gravel crunch under my car wheels as I pulled into the parking lot. The location was rustic, but thinking about it now, I can't say anything seemed sinister. There weren't many cars, but then again, we were a little ways off the beaten path. Richard and Denise must have seen me pull up as they were already walking over to my car. We exchanged the usual greetings and then headed inside. The place was nice. Unremarkable, but cozy. Even the neon beer sign in the window was charming in its own way. On the wall behind the cash register hung a large blackboard with the daily specials written on it. At the bottom, it read, Try our milkshake. He milled around in front of the please wait to be seated sign until a girl in a black t-shirt and an apron stepped out of the back. She walked over and told us to sit anywhere we like and she would be with us in just a minute. Sure enough, a minute later she came back with three menus and three glasses of water. Making small talk, Richard commented that it must have been a slow night. Our waitress, Stacy, agreed. She told us they actually did more business on weekday mornings than on the weekends, which made sense. Weekends are for fancy dinners in the big city, after all. Already, I could feel the predictable banality of the evening setting. I was sure at any moment the conversation would shift to the weather. Beautiful weather, though. Great night to get out, Denise chimed in as destiny asserted itself. Stacy nodded and smiled, and I caught a glimpse of her teeth. They were green. She could have just finished eating a salad, I guess. And yet I couldn't stop the word gangrene from popping into my head. A terrible thought, but it faded quickly. Stacy went off to place our order while Denise, Richard, and I began our ritualized process of catching up on recent events. Food came, and it was good. Not as amazing as Richard's friend had claimed, but tasty enough to take my mind off of my own petty concerns. Finished, Richard wiped his mouth and said, I think I'm going to take that sign's advice and get a milkshake. He was decisive, and when Stacy came back, we all ordered one. Oh, you're going to love it, she said, smiling wide enough for a prolonged view of the green plaque crusted around her teeth. That definitely wasn't salad. A few minutes later, Stacy was back with her milkshakes. Now, I'm not exaggerating when I say they were amazing. In fact, they were the best milkshakes I've ever had. The best food, period. Keep that in mind, because for just the briefest moment, the flavor on the tip of my tongue was of rancid milk. Maybe even worse. Although I have no idea what a rotting corpse tastes like. But in an instant, that sensation was forgotten. 
lost in an ocean of delicious, creamy goodness. I had tasted manna from heaven, and it was a flippin' milkshake. Denise and Richard were enraptured too, and it was getting difficult to concentrate. Time started to malfunction. We didn't speak, we didn't look at each other, we, we barely even breathed as we kept sucking down our drinks. I must have had enough awareness, though, to spot Stacy out of the corner of my eye. She was standing there, swaying slightly, gaping at us with a dead look on her face. Maybe it was the light, or maybe it was my euphoric haze, but I swear more of that green mold had spread over her, into her hairline and over her lips. Her eyes were yellow and wet. Richard Straw had made a harsh sucking noise as he vacuumed up the last drops of milkshake from his glass. He raised his head, and the expression on his face was both confused and feral. Another, he said, sputtering out milk as he spoke. Stacy twitched out a nod of confirmation, waddling off to the kitchen. I looked over at Denise. Her blouse was moist, with little stray bits of whipped cream and sprinkles stuck to it. She seemed dazed, frightened a horrified prisoner of her own culinary delight. Shortly, Stacy returned with another round of milkshakes. And then another. And another. Time became as blended and shapeless as the milkshakes themselves. I had no idea how long we sat there or how many shakes we had. I remember Richard laughing like a lunatic when a blood vessel burst in Stacy's eye, filling it up with a web of red veins. Later, Denise started screaming for no apparent reason. The vibrato of her throat caused the milk welling up in it to bubble as it poured out over her chin. Everything on the table was covered in milk. So were Richard and Denise. So was I. It was on our hands, in our hair, in our eyes. It had begun to pile up, solidifying into white mounds of quivering ooze. As I lifted my glass to my mouth, Strings of sticky milk stretched out from my arm to the table, studded with colored sprinkles and melted chocolate chips. Chunks of white foam sloughed off Richard's mouth as he said, Look, I gotta ask, how do you make these milkshakes, Zeb? They're the best thing I've ever had in my whole life. Who is Zeb? That's a question I would have asked myself if I still had any capacity for rational thought. I only know that Zeb had been chatting with us for some time. I assumed he ran the place. He was very friendly, like a giant pile of middle-aged sausage with thick, meaty hands and a smile that stretched open as wide as a slit throat. Well, Rick, Zeb answered, why don't I show ya? Seeing is believing, like my pastor used to say. Zeb reached down with his chunky ham fingers and started unbuttoning his shirt. We all watched, fixated. As he worked his way down, Zeb smiled. Grease poured out of his mouth, moistening his meaty lips. You see, folks, the secret ingredient is love, Zeb said as he undid the last button and pulled his shirt open. His midsection was a giant maggot with stumpy fat legs grasping at the air, curling in and out like a newborn baby with too many limbs. The tip of each leg ended in a little black areola, with a drizzle of milky liquid trickling out. If you want the full experience, Zeb continued, it's best to go to the right source. He emphasized his point by gently squeezing one of the grubby limbs. A stream of goo shot out in an arc. Despite the cloud that still hung over my mind, the utter horror of the situation started to creep in. Fear and revulsion began to slowly pull me back to my senses. Still, I couldn't bring myself to move or scream. I sat there, glued to the table in a cocoon of white sludge. Denise was completely gone, I could see. Pure terror was plastered over her face, milk pouring out of her mouth like a pitcher overflowing with water. For his part, Richard was fascinated. He looked hungry, gazing at the bloated worm thing that was Zeb's torso. Zeb eyed Richard and smiled. You like that, don't ya? Richard crept towards Zeb, bending down until his face was level with one of the flabby little legs. 
He wrapped his lips around the nub and started sucking. The image reminded me of kittens nestled up against their mother's tummy while she feeds them, but awful and with humanoid grubworms instead. We got a happy customer here, Zeb said to Stacy, who was now completely tinted green and starting to grow patches of moss all over her body. Richard's belly began to swell, forcing its way out from underneath his shirt. Bumps started to form on his skin, drawing up so tightly that the flesh on each blister stretched out into a translucent membrane. One by one, they popped open, revealing little compound eyes that darted back and forth. The back of his shirt jumped. Something underneath was punching upward. After several violent thrusts, two growths tore through the fabric. Iridescent fly wings unfolded from Richard's back, glistening in the light. Holy cow, Zeb said. He's an angel. Richard pulled his face away from Zeb's chest. It was a visage of pure ecstasy caked in a layer of creamy white slime. His newly formed wings fluttered in quick bursts of what I can only assume was pleasure. And then I noticed that Stacy had moved back to the kitchen, which was now somehow fully visible. She wrapped the gangrenous tendrils that were once her fingers around the freezer door's handle and swung it open. It was a meat locker. No, bigger. Much bigger. There was an entire meat packing plant in there. I saw row after row of bloody carcasses all strung up on hooks. There was more than one floor even. It was a, a cathedral of slaughter, packed with slabs of dripping meat of all different shapes and sizes, as far as the eye could see, stretching back until they disappeared into the pink haze that illuminated the expanse. Go on now, Angel, Zeb said to the bug thing Richard had become. Fly on up to heaven. And, and, and so Richard took flight. Buzzing filled the air as he lifted his bloated body off the ground. He hovered above the table for a minute, turning his insectoid gaze to us. Best dinner I ever had, Richard told us, before flying in a zigzag pattern towards the open wound that was the freezer door. Richard soared up into the lofty heights above, bobbing in between the rows of dangling meat. He was just like a little fly, about to settle on a freshly rotten corpse. And then he froze in midair. A massive shape began to fill up the luminous void at the back of the freezer. It surged forward, engulfing everything in its dark crimson bulk. I, I, I think it was a gargantuan, worm-like tongue. And as it thrust toward Richard's helpless form, it opened up, unfurling into a gaping mouth studded with a bouquet of vast, twitching fangs. Richard vanished into the black hole of its gullet, and in that instant, I finally managed to scream. So did Denise, and I don't think she ever stopped from that point on. I thrashed violently, struggling to disentangle myself from the wet web sticking my body to the chair. That's when I noticed there was a pig sitting at the table next to ours. It had a fork, and it was eating itself. The pig smiled at me and said, Try the pork, Bob. It's delicious. My name isn't Bob, and even stricken with abject terror, I recognize the futility of arguing with a demonic pig. All the revulsion, the abominations, the, the sheer impossibility of the night suddenly stuck in my guts, swelling upward into my chest, welling up in my throat until I couldn't take any longer and started vomiting violently. A geyser of white milk shot out of my mouth, cascading to the floor and pooling up around my feet. Zeb looked at me and said, Huh, maybe you're lactose intolerant. I fell forward, caught in midair by the few strands of webbing that still held me. For a moment I hovered there, exhausted, looking down at half-digested sprinkles and gummy bears floating in the sea of bile and milk I had just produced. And then the webs gave way and I crashed to the floor, making a splash as I landed. The shock knocked me back to my senses. The full weight of danger dawned on me. Panic struck. I flailed around, fighting to get my footing. Zeb saw me struggle and stood up. Hold on there, I'm coming. He reached out with one of his big, meaty hands as he drew closer, and as he leaned in, the maggot in his torso spasmed with anticipation. I'm not sure if I meant to kick Zeb, but I did. 
My foot struck his knee, making a squishy splat noise as it landed. He stumbled backwards from the blow, slipping on the liquid coating the floor. As he toppled onto his back, Zeb let out a sharp squeal. The fall must have taken the wind out of him, because he didn't move. The worm that was his stomach did, though, its fat little limbs grasping at the air helplessly. Finally, my strength came back, and my sense of reality returned. I felt better all of a sudden, and managed to hoist myself off the floor. I didn't even bother to look at Zeb, I just turned and ran to the front door as fast as I could. The vaguely humanoid pile of spinach that Stacy had turned into shouted from behind me. The milkshakes are on the house! I shot through the door, and felt the cleansing night air on my skin. I ran straight to my car, got in, and drove off. Everything was a blur. I couldn't think, I couldn't make sense of anything. Terror slowly gave way to relief, tinged with a lingering unease. Revolting thoughts tugged at the corners of my mind. Fortunately, I managed to keep them from seeping back in, mostly. A full day had gone by before I remembered Denise. I left her there. Didn't even give a second thought to saving her. I doubt there was much I could have done anyhow. Still, poor Denise. Oh well. I've been surprised at how little leaving her behind had bothered me. Time moves on, and so do people, I guess. I do get nightmares occasionally. Now and then, a disembodied sense of sickness creeps over me. For the most part, though, I've gotten on with my life. I can't say for certain how real any of this was. I mean, Richard and Denise were real, and they are missing. But I know I wasn't in my right mind that night. Something happened, though. A year later, I finally mustered the courage to drive by the place. Nothing was there. No restaurant, no parking lot, no indication that there ever even was a building there. Richard never mentioned the name of his friend who recommended the diner, so that's a dead end. Not that I'm eager to find it. But who knows? Maybe you will. If you do, take my advice. Don't try the milkshake. I'm not a weirdo. I was drunk. And until you've had the night I had, somehow spam texting the most gay emoji to your boyfriend while shouting, tequila and red wine is so a cocktail. Until you've been there, I ask you not to judge. If you have been there, you'll know that my boyfriend became my ex-boyfriend that night. You'll know that neither he nor I are Muslim and that the most gay is in the blurry vicinity of the hospital emoji. You'll know that tequila and red wine is not a cocktail. And most importantly, you'll know that at three in the morning, drunk as Saharan bottled water, sushi is sushi. I wouldn't have remembered any of the... Honestly, I wouldn't have remembered any of the gas station or its dubious offerings, except that I thought I saw the guy who played Draco Malfoy in the Harry Potter movies. I tried to play amateur paparazzo, and I left the video on record after my phone went back in my pocket. The important folks are me, my friend and roommate Benjamin, and a very accommodating cashier that I'm just gonna call Leaf. His hair is white because that's an old man, idiot. Well, that's such a Slytherin thing. <gasps> mm, um, to be. He's got a walker! No, mm -mm, no, if that's... He's a walker on his hands. Yeah, see? Old man! Not Malfoy. <laughs> But Broom, you're jealous. You get the idea. I had forced myself into a subhuman hole of obnoxious intoxication, and I had found my AARP wizard bad boy, I was certain of that. He was my boozy tinfoil treasure, my distraction from the crown jewel of my tire fire evening. Oh, yes! Sushi! 
Gross. This is an Exxon. 7-Eleven is good sushi, dude. 100% it doesn't. And this is an Exxon station. I picked it up. Now, in hindsight, I understand Ben's consternation. He was being a friend. I was repaying him by being that intolerable child at the grocery store whose parents quietly pretend it's a ward of the produce aisle. Not a great look. Of course, I had zero capacity for that sort of self-reflection in that moment, so I soldiered on with my dream of eating and not getting bodulism. The packaging was simple. Sushi connection. Happy chase roll. I found it later on in my apartment and that's all it said. No ingredients, no graphics, no barcode. Just black plastic, clear plastic, and a sharpied stick-on label. But I wasn't some deputized food inspector. I was drunk and hungry. It's not even refrigerated. If you eat that, you're totally gonna die. It's in a restaurant. It's fine. This isn't... Ugh. Hey, you work here. Would you eat this sushi? Uh, I mean... Dude, not even... Wait. Your name tag. Is your name actually Buckminster? No. Okay, well, not Buckminster wouldn't eat it. And he seems... normal-ish. I guess. The normal thing is not to eat the sketch sushi. Okay? How much, Buckblender? It's... uh... free. What? Sweet. Arigato. Damn it. Ben was wrong. I ate it. I didn't die. But I didn't stay drunk for long after my happy chase roll burrowed its way down into my gastrointestinal ripcord and yanked. Please understand, I've been sick before. I've had stomach bugs, food poisoning, and a few particularly vicious hangovers. This was more like the contents of my stomach were fleeing the neighborhood because a family of knives moved in next door. It was agonizing. It was agonizing, disgusting in a way that the word slurry seems fitting to describe the end results. I slept on a bath mat that night, but when I woke up, I was fine. No, no, better than fine. Great. fan friggin tastic maybe. Three voicemails from Steve, my unmuslim unboyfriend. I didn't care. The worry of what I might have said at the bar and what I definitely said before seemed insubstantial, distant in a way. Like the memory of an anxious exam dream after waking up to find yourself graduated in 30-something. I smelled... not great. And the hard tile and terry cloth that had been my bed left a physical impression on my joints, but I felt... I don't know. Light. Happy. It wasn't a typical morning for me, and not just because I had played Big Spoon to a toilet all night. I suffer from anxiety... I suffer from anxiety. Not the kind that leads me to being unemployable, but the kind that paints my mornings with a film of hyperventilation and stomach-twisting dread. It usually passes in time, but between the heart palpitations and the spiraling agenda of ever-worsening concocted sequences, it's pretty draining. The day after the sushi, the first thing I thought about was brushing my teeth and washing off my night in a hot shower. So normal. Ben seemed surprised to see me awake and making breakfast at what I realized was 10 a.m. I'd been whistling, whistling, and the NPR program playing through a speaker the one about a suicide bombing followed by some tax change that was supposed to give the 1% even more money or something. It was white noise. The sound of a friendly voice talking without a hint of actual meaning. Morning, Ben. Eggs? Uh... How are you so chipper? What's wrong with you? Skepticism. A part of me got it, but my thoughts said nothing. Absolutely nothing's wrong, man. You like cheese, right? We had cheddar. Seemed to go just fine with the peppers. Yeah. Oh, Ben. He filled me in on our night. We had been drinking because things were going, well, crappy between Steve and me. I thought he might have been cheating. The notion of which bloomed in my mind as a vine that turned into a straw and sucked up every ounce of alcohol I could find in my local watering hole. Ben had been my gardener for the night, trying and failing to keep the growth in line. In the end, it hadn't mattered. My vine strangled the life out of my relationship with Steve, but that morning, cooking eggs and listening to the crackle of a flaming world, 
Nothing mattered. You were screaming last night, Ben said, tentatively wrapping strings of melted neon cheese around his fork. You locked the bathroom door and you were screaming, Don't come near me! Or something. Any idea what that was about? I, uh... I hadn't any. I remember drinking. I remember the taste of rice and something like potting soil, metal shavings, and vinegar. And then I remember waking up. Not a clue. But today seems better, right? He didn't answer, but I thought he did. And the next day after. But on day three, my inexplicable bliss had faded. Now, faded is too gentle a word. My zen cloudboy beach vacation mindset, the picture that seemed to have been painted on a mental storefront window in carefree Tahitian hues. Day three picked up a rock and with a toss, started the mind riot. Steve's gone. He's right to be gone. If he was cheating on me, it's because I'm bad. Worthless. I'm just a burden to him. To everyone. Ben's gonna leave too. He's already distant. We don't talk like we used to. Probably just sees me as a roommate, not a real friend. He's already gone, just waiting for the right moment to leave. Without him, I'll have an empty room. Things will be too quiet. Just the sound of me, my thoughts, trying to drive what little happiness remains for myself. <laughs> I'll probably leave me too. I'll lose me when I try to find a new roommate and they'll see it. They'll know how worthless I am, and I'll lose the apartment, my job. How long will my parents put up with me when I move back home? They're friends with my high school English teacher. Mr. Palmer said I had promise. And he'll find out that I failed. He'll tell everyone else. My parents won't want a pariah in their house, in their lives. They'll leave me too. And what then? And what am I going to do? No one to talk to, will I forget the sound of my own voice? It'll be easier to ignore them. Like a shadow on the wall, slowly fading as everyone else's happiness lights the world around me and erases the ugly stain of my existence. I'll collapse in some corner somewhere, just like a pile of refuse. Alone, cold, hungry. Hungry. Sushi! Ah, oh, crap. Everything had changed with the sushi. I had expelled a mental disorder into a toilet bowl, right? I talked to Ben. He told me which Exxon we had gone to. He also told me I was crazy, but I needed the bliss that an hour or two of agony had bought. I needed the buoyant exuberance of mental vacancy, the warmth of unbridled optimism. The Xanax would have been a bandage of mud to cover a festering wound. I needed a cure. Divine stitches wrapped in flaking nori. I needed it because what was rising around me wasn't just anxiety. It was memory. Don't come near me. I was beginning to remember what it was. Leave slash Buckminster wasn't working when I returned. The cashier, Carl, looked perplexed when I asked the question. Hey, where is your sushi? Sushi? Um... This is an Exxon. Closest thing we have is cigarettes. I could cut one up for you. Wouldn't recommend eating it, though. What? No, your sushi. I was in here a few nights ago. I bought some, or I guess got some. It was free, and... Carl returned a look of wrinkled despondence typically reserved for sidewalk evangelists and public transit ranters. To him, I was crazy. Noted. I pivoted. I was super drunk. I saw the justification click. Ah, yep. Well, sorry, my guy. Maybe it was a food truck? Yeah, maybe. He smiled and my brain went for a walk in the briar patch as I began to meander the tiny store in silence. Carl can only stand the lie. The fake you. How long can you fake it, though? Be honest. The real you is an obstacle. It's a rotting, tire-flattened raccoon in the street, tempting a glance, but only in a wary revulsion. Don't come near me! I realized that I was winded, faint, face flush, and feeling sweaty. 
How could such a small Exxon market hide something so vital? A fridge. One tall shelving unit in the center. Jumper cables and candy and plastic funnels and travel Benadryl. I circled it, looking high and low as the expression of disgusted misunderstanding began to clamp itself back around Carl's face. Where would you even put sushi here? Where would it go? Where? <gasps> there. I stopped and saw something resting on the ground, peeking out from the bottom of the shelf. Dirty, dusty, cobwebby. Sushi Co. Hap. I felt a whisper of bliss pop in my mind and trickle down my back in the shivery tingle like some consciousness-destroying ruptured aneurysm. I knelt to reach out, but just as I did, the package slipped away under the shelf. A deft little cockroach of a thing, retreating, fleeing, crinkling, don't come near me, in a plasticky hiss. No! I shouted loud enough that my eyes instinctively shot over to the judgmental Carl and his mock sushi nicotine poisoning schemes. Earbuds. He was wearing earbuds, catatonically engrossed in his own little dopamine fix that was some video. At least I had that momentary karmic kindness. When my blindly groping hand found nothing beneath the shelf but a dusty worn and a lump of something ugh, greasy, I slipped around the other side to the next aisle. The sight of legs caught me by surprise as I scrambled across the dingy floor. Worn black brogues and slim gray trousered legs climbing toward a man in a suit holding my sushi. He was trim apart from a pudgy round face that seemed out of place atop his long wool flannel frame. The thought that he hadn't been there mere moments ago, and that his entrance hadn't rung the bing-bonging electric doorbell, and that he smiled as serenely as a golden alpine Buddha. All of that paled in comparison to the need to possess the treacherous plastic package and its heavenly contents. The man didn't move, didn't acknowledge me. He just stood, smiling through squinty eyes punched into skin like shallow molding clay. And he was whispering something again and again. Hey buddy, that's my sushi, I half shouted. <sighs> hey, I saw it first, I had dibs, you baldy lollipop looking creep. <sighs> Give me the sushi, or I'll- I began to pick out some of his words through the sound of my own hammering pulse. Hey, uh, hello? <laughs> Give me the sushi, or I'll sock you. It was only as I felt the desperate rage building. The itchy precursor to a dozen different violent acts that played through my mind, but I actually listened to what he was saying. I used to have a beautiful family. Alice, Malcolm, little Fiona. Don't come near me. Don't come near. I used to have a beautiful family. His hands were shaking. The whispers crept from the pinhole parting of his lips like some tensing, giddy whistle. He was repulsive, unworthy of the treasure he held. He was weak and I was hungry. He's just a flat raccoon, I thought. He's nothing. You need it more. When I snatched it, he started weeping, tears pouring from the puckered eye holes of his doughy face. But he didn't grab at me. He didn't fight like I would have. <laughs> As I tore off the top of the package and gorged on the tumorous lumps of rice and slippery gray meat, chewing ginger grit and licking an acrid smear of wasabi, as I entered my jittery longing, he just sobbed. <laughs> the first is always free. He sputtered as my mind drilled into the sound of my tongue on textured black plastic. I heard him, but as I roused from my bout of gluttony, one fleeting thought came to the fore. Had he said, don't come near me? Wait, he? Who? I was alone in the aisle. Crumpled, happy chase roll plastic staring up at me from the ground. Whoa. I didn't feel quite right. Allergies, maybe? I found myself flickering a watering tongue around my mouth, trying to dislodge a flavor like peaty scotch and chewed aspirin and cold sores. Next, I was running, 
fumbling with a key in my front door, clutching my stomach as invisible daggers pinned my navel to my backbone. I was in the bathroom again, Ben pounding on the door, shouting something. I was heaving my entire being into the toilet with such force that I wondered if one might be able to turn themselves inside out through the mouth. I was gripping the bath mat. I was staring at the shower curtain, at movement, at a face. I was screaming, shaking, listening to a voice rasping hot breath into my ear. First is always free. The rest will cost you. I was crying, sobbing, snotty, desperate tears. Don't come near me! Don't come near me! Don't! I was tired, exhausted. And then awake. <laughs> Happy. It was worse this time. Ben said over a table of cheesy eggs and cut fruit. I don't know what you mean. I feel great, Ben. He didn't look convinced, but it was the truth. He was entitled to his worries. It was fine. I was talking to Steve last night about this sushi thing. Don't be mad. I'm trying to not have you die in the bathroom. Mad? Ben, I'm fan friggin -tastic. Honestly, you're worrying over nothing. Dude, Steve agrees with me. You don't know what's in that sushi. Some hallucinogenic, maybe. I don't know. But you looked like death yesterday. The screams and the crying and- Ben, stop. I'm fine. I'm fan free. Fantastic. Whatever. Look, there was something else. Ben was being so dramatic. I remember going to the Exxon, getting sushi from a quirky cashier named Carl and eating it. It was an acquired taste, sure, but hardly dangerous. Something else? Very suspenseful, Ben. Twiddled my fingers at him and he swatted them away. Okay, this seems crazy, but I think I heard another voice in the bathroom with you. Someone whispering. And when I tried to open the door, it felt like someone was holding it shut. Like the doorknob turned and there was some give, but... Something pushed back. <sighs> Benjamin, so serious. What an absolute goofball. Hey, I just don't want you to die, okay? Will you listen to me? Please! Maybe there wasn't enough cheese in Ben's eggs. I made a mental note. More cheese next time. Steve doesn't want you to die either. I'm sorry about... I've got to tell you that... Ugh. <sighs> Look, we just want you to be okay. Ben, Ben, Ben. I lost my anxiety, and somebody found it. Nothing a little sushi couldn't fix. Please. Was he crying? I smiled back at him. Please. Always so polite when it came to eggs. Of course he could have some more. I wasn't particularly hungry anyway. I felt full of nothing. It's weird how that works sometimes. The following day was positively effervescent. I hummed tunes. I watched a bird for an hour at some point. I sighed easy sighs. But day three came with depression, a panic attack, and a package at the door. Ben was at a cafe doing work. I had called in sick and I only dragged myself across the floor to stop the insistent pounding of the postman. The package, strangely enough, cut through the sea of intermittent flailing and submersion for a bit. The label was simple. To Toma, me, from Sushi Connection. No postage, no address, no answers to a dozen questions that immediately tangled in my mind. I opened it, curiosity straining to overcome my trepidation. The contents didn't make sense right away. The contents didn't make sense right away. Five plastic bags, fillet knife, annotated human anatomical diagram. Liver, gallbladder, right thigh, quadriceps, left shoulder, deltoid, descending aorta. Maybe I just didn't want it to make sense. 
The implication was <laughs> clear enough. A knife and one bag for each circled body part? Liver? Aorta? It was physiological necessity of those parts wasn't lost on me. The package was a request. Maybe a demand. I, I try to avoid thoughts of the transaction. One that might let me rent happiness. But as I tried to muddy the trajectory, my mind wandered, plumbing the depths of mental decline. I was bad on the second day three. I had spiraled down seemingly all the myriad pits of dread possibilities. They grew deeper with each descent, more abstract and terrifying. It was worse this time. I remembered Ben saying that. Did he know what would happen ahead of time? Was he a part of it? He didn't stop me from going back. Steve didn't stop me. No one did. The man in the Exxon market, I remembered him too. He seemed so happy to let me have the sushi. He put on a show with his tears and then he vanished. But why? Probably to collude with Ben and Steve and the thing in the bathroom. I remembered it in, I remembered it too in broad strokes. Wet and bony fingers caressing my back, pinching at my sweat-soaked shirt, reveling in my agony. They were all in on it together. Steve and Ben and the off-brand Exxon Slenderman and the Thing. All of them, waiting for me to become as monstrous as them. They want me to say it. Don't come near me. And then they'll leave me and feel righteous for it. It'll be my fault. They'll blame me for being afraid of them, but terrified of being alone. They'll say I deserve it for pushing them away to save myself. And they won't come back. Not even the monster in the bathroom. They'll all abandon me. I looked at the package. The label. Sushi connection. The sushi transcended all that bullcrap. It wouldn't leave. It came in plastic captivity. An offering. My offering. It took away all the doubt and the fear. A joy factory that only asked for one simple thing. Connection. It wanted me to become a part of something. To contribute something. It feeds to feed. Like a mother eating one child to make milk for another. I looked at the words on the label and they sang a symphony of possibility to me. Each syllable was awash with a promise of levity. Eat the roll. Chase the happy. Liver, gallbladder, thigh, shoulder, aorta. Recipe for connection. I hugged the knife to my chest, felt the plastic of the bags between my fingers. Five bags. I'd find a way to contribute, a way to connect with something happy. That was then. Day three, Round two. A hard day followed by a goal that gave me purpose. Now I'm anxiety free again. But I have a secret that consumes me. Something I want to tell so badly that it scratches around inside of me like a caged rat. It's a hard secret. The kind of secret that I know in the pit of my stomach will change everything. It'll hurt someone I care about. Steve sits with me in my living room, clutching a mug of lukewarm coffee. I sit beside him, a squishy cushion like a whispering man's face between us. So, you're okay? He asks, smile peeking through a pair of puppy dog eyes. I love those eyes. Not long ago, I'd seen them filled with tears. Not anymore. Yeah, I'm fan friggin' I'm fine. I smile, knowing that relief is a confession away, and in a pinch, relief feels just like diet happiness. So, uh, Ben said he'd be back today. Do you know when? So much anticipation in his words. I lie. Soon. The secret nags at me, wanting to be free, but I know that the more it builds and wriggles through my head, the greater the relief will be. Ben's not coming back soon. 
Ben's not coming back at all. It should be a sad thing for me. A piece of my recent history that sits inside my guts like a lump of lead. But it's not. Yes. I killed Ben. My roommate, my friend. And the act, at the time, was devastating. I'm a monster, blah blah blah, I get it, mea culpa. But that's not the secret. Steve, I love Ben to death, you know that, right? Another lie, but he nods appreciatively, a moony smile crawling across his face. I remember when that smile meant everything to me. Before everything turned into some hellish sitcom. I do, Toma. You're a good friend. Better than anyone deserves, probably. I sigh as the tension builds in me. I made a few texts from Ben's phone after... the deed. It seemed like something a murderer would do. Like a TV plotline that a grim-faced detective might find onerous. I had seen Ben enter his passcode dozens of times since face masks made it practically a necessity in public. I remembered the pattern, but never thought much about the numbers. 0528. A line, up then down again. Simple passcode. But also, 0528. May the 28th. <laughs> I had killed him before I even realized. Steve's birthday. When I found out, Steve, I was actually kind of... Relieved. Why? And let's be honest, what we were was... What we were was never going to be sustainable. Why? Okay, maybe true, actually. You and Ben are together, and I'm okay with that. Do I never get tired of saying that? It's a gut punch, yes. And I do feel that, but more than anything, I feel relief. He sees the genuine Christmas morning, you don't have cancer, elation on my face. I see the warmth of gratitude soft in his. And then his eyes fix on something. Toma, what's that? He points to a plastic container on the floor. Sushi connection. I smile back. It's an inside joke between Ben and I. Poor taste, but you know. Guilty Ben roll. I laugh as Ben's guilt begins to creep back into my mind again. The affair was a burden for him. I could feel that the moment I awoke on my bathroom floor after eating a small package of sushi that arrived at my doorstep. I had contributed to the connection and they returned a taste of Ben's emotional complexity. It just wasn't exactly what I expected. I thought the sushi created happiness, but it seems that someone named Chase did. I look into Steve's eyes. <laughs> I smile feeling only the fear of hurting myself with another person's secret. I let it build. Steve's lip quivers. I thought this would destroy you, Toma. I really did. And I didn't mean for it to happen. Neither of us did. It just... happened. <laughs> the us stings almost imperceptibly as it rolls into my borrowed guilt. And you're so understanding and, well, sweet about it. But after the text that night, and the phone call, and then that weird sushi. Steve, I know. It's okay. I'm okay. I feel like I could cry, Toma. Don't. Come near me. I put up my arms for a hug, and he falls into it. I pat his back. Conciliation in an uncomfortably platonic gesture. It feels weird coming from me, but I use that emotional confusion to grab onto something that feels like the honesty of a revealed secret. I'm glad it was him. He's a good guy, and if it was anyone, I'm glad it was him. I just want you to be happy. Truly. Steve pulls away and takes measure of my expression. And then he beams. You have no idea how happy that makes me. But I do. Blank. Steve roll. Just happy enough to fill a blank space in my mind with something fan friggin -tastic. When you're happy, Steve, I'm happy too. We share a smile, a fleeting connection, a happy 
little lie. You're not getting any younger. My best friend of me, Rebecca, reminded me. She expertly applied the makeup remover, dabbing quickly, the big bulbs of the antique dressing room mirror giving me an instant headache. I felt a bit feverish, to be honest. I'd been hoping Rebecca was going to help me. Listen, darling. I am a Morgan Lorraine. I have a trust fund, a pedigree. There is always a role for me. She waved meaningfully with the cotton puff at her dressing room and all its Broadway paraphernalia. But you, love? You're so... so... She floundered. So what? I asked, praying I could trade her dressing room for the cool darkness of the theater's recesses. But hunger knows no pride. Common! Oh, don't get me wrong, darling. You are gorgeous, for sure. But, out in Tinseltown, it's a dozen donuts to the dollar. Rebecca peered close into the mirror. Wrinkles, crow's feet, old man time, darling. He waits for nobody. I made no remark hoping the makeup would remove and we could get out of that dressing room. It was stifling. And the voices everywhere? How could anybody think? Knock, knock. Rebecca's friends Patrick and Veronica were in the door with a bouquet of roses. You were fantastic! I was blown away. You're amazing. Veronica and Patrick conveniently ignored me as if I weren't there. Rebecca, having successfully removed her stage makeup, was slipping into a designer dress and heels. Veronica! Whatever happened? You're as lame as a daffy duck! Ah, uh, you know, it's just how search gets sometimes, she said, handing her the roses. But I got the part! Rebecca wrinkled her brow, then unwrinkled and brightened up. They're beautiful. I'll put them in water. Now you two run to the limousine. I need a minute. Patrick held the door open with great efficiency, and Veronica did an about-face and limped out gingerly. They closed the door behind them just as gingerly, and Rebecca turned to me. Listen, darling, I have an event tonight, but so do you, she said, putting the card in my hand. I've already told Serge to expect you at a suite at nine. I took the card. Serge? I said. Really? Oh, come, don't be such a child. He's seen your reel, and he has the perfect part to put your perfect little tush on the map. Now you see that door? I want you to use it. Unless... I can always find you a job as a governess or some such. There's really no shame in it. An hour later, I rode the elevator up looking down at the business card. It read, Serge Weisenhammer, President. Wilkensky Weisenhammer Films. In gilded letters on a heavy cardstock. I looked at my watch. Almost nine. Ugh, I felt lightheaded. The elevator doors opened, and I walked down the hall looking for the royal penthouse suite. At the end of the long hall, I knocked on the gilded door. I stood there, shifting my weight nervously from left heel to right. The expensive shoes Rebecca had insisted I wore were annoying my feet. Just a second. A voice from the other side informed. Be right there. I continued shifting, and then I stopped as the door opened, revealing an aging man in a hotel bathrobe and slippers. A large cigar sat between yellow teeth. His beady dark eyes took a walk all over me, and then he removed the cigar and smiled with no mirth. Well, you must be Vanessa. He said, opening the door wide and gesturing me inside. I stood there nervously. I saw a slight look of impatience cross his face. Uh, come in, come in. Rebecca told me all about you. Inside, there was a table laid out with a banquet fit for a king. Lobster, champagne, crab legs, sushi. Sit down, sit down. He said, beckoning to the couch. I moved a cushion aside and sat down. I adjusted my skirt and smiled. 
It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Weisenhammer. I just want to thank you for seeing- Call me Serge. All my friends do. He interrupted. Oh, pleasure to meet you, Serge, I said. Serge approached me with two champagne flutes outstretched. I received one in my hand. Serge sat down next to me so that his shoulder and arm brushed mine. I readjusted myself back a few inches. Listen, honey. I saw your reel. I got a part for you in Bingster's next movie. It's a real cherry. I just gotta know, though. I gotta know if you're hungry. He said, sucking down the entire glass of bubbly in one long pull. Serge got a cigar going again with a gold lighter. He adjusted his bathrobe so that I could see more of his chest. He stared at mine. I shifted a little uneasily. Well? He asked. Yes, I want the part, Mr. V I mean, Serge. He frowned. Yeah, but are you hungry? Yes. I answered in a soft, anxious voice. Well, sweetheart, I gotta tell you, it's a crazy night. I'm multitasking all over the place. My masseuse just canceled on me. Oh, why don't we discuss this in the other room? You can give me a nice massage. We could talk about your future. I looked at his face. It was as if time was dilating. I heard a fly buzz and then land on his champagne flutes before absconding. Well, Serge, I don't think I would feel comfortable. Aren't you married? A dark cloud passed over his face. I looked at the door nervously, and then his face grew stormy. Listen, babe. He said, coming closer, a wolfish grin crossing his lips. I can make you a star. I stood up. Serge, it's been truly an honor meeting you, but I really have to be going. His hot breath covered my face in an instant. Why did he move so fast? He grabbed my wrist. I clenched my jaw and put my hand against his chest. Come on. You know you like it. You just need some discipline. That's how you know I care. I looked at the door desperately. I didn't know if I could hold out. I was growing so faint. What if someone comes? I whispered. Serge laughed. He knew I wouldn't resist. I felt so weak. Come on, babe. It's massage time. I let Serge lead me into the master bedroom. He lay down on the king-size bed. You better hurry now. I got places to see and people to do. He said before <laughs> laughing alone at his own joke. A cigar smoldered in an onyx ashtray. I, I crawled upon the bed. He lay face down expectantly. I looked into the mirror and felt hollow inside. I couldn't see myself, and I felt the thirsting. I put my hand on his back and felt my fingers tremble. Damn, your hands are cold. He complained. And then... Ah, but we'll be getting hot in no time at all. I moved my hand gently up his spine and let my nails caress his Adam's apple. He shuddered and said, What are you doing? I told you to massage me. I leaned in close so my hair brushed his face and kneaded his back muscle. My lips brushed against his ear, and I whispered, Thanks for inviting me in. It makes it so much easier on a starving artist. Yeah, I was feeling charitable tonight. I might even be gentle. Really? I said. Then I felt my teeth ache. The bones in my upper jaws trembled and my overbite jutted. I don't think that'll be on the menu tonight. A girl has to have boundaries, after all. I opined before I sank aching fangs deep within the soft flesh of his throat. I smelled orchids as I allowed his blood to fill the eternal void. I remained in that position for many minutes until I was no longer parched. And then I satisfied my true craving. Marrow, a delicacy. I wanted to savor this. Thirty minutes later, I was freshly showered, riding the elevator down to the lobby and out into the hot desert air. I had a content feeling in my belly I was mindful of. It's important for an actor to be mindful. 
mindful, and well-fed. Sometimes Hollywood eats a young girl up, and sometimes she can dine on the Walk of Fame, one star at a time.